Oh, it's a universal picture. I bet it's charade. I am uh, Stanley Donnan, uh, and I produced and directed this picture. I hope you'll forgive me. And I'm Peter Stone, and I wrote it, and um, you don't have to forgive me. I'm pleased as punch. All right, this shot reminds me how difficult it was to make because in order to time it, it's a real train, and the train didn't come on my cue. I had to make the shot on the train's cue. And in order to do that, I had to time how long this pan around would take and how long for the train to arrive. And I had a man very far away on a radio telling me when the train was, I don't remember, five miles away in order to get this shot in time. Here it is, bang. Are you telling me that's a real train? No, that's a fake. Oh, I, I, I see. I remember how they did that. He went and dove off a little platform. Behind the train. Behind that's the train. right. Now, here come the titles. Oh, is that? Oh, I see. Yeah. Let's talk about Binder. Maurice Binder, very good man. He did he, so many of them for you. Well, he started doing his first titles were for me. He had never done a film title. He had done a, a, an advertisement for me in a newspaper. And I thought his visual sense was so good, I asked him to do the titles for Indiscreet. That was the first movie he did. And then he did... All the Bond. All the Bond. All the Bonds in a number of my movies. Mm -hmm. Maurice Binder got the Bond job from seeing, I think, uh, maybe not Charade, but some movie that he did for me. He was a charming fellow. He was indeed. And great fun. Yeah. Charles Lang was, we'll talk about Charles Lang, the cameraman, later on, because he was a terrific, uh, uh, so he was a terrific character. But the score was written by Henry Mancini, and... Uh, what I, did he ever go on to do? He went on to write a lot of other things. Oh. Um, but uh, I think this is the first movie that, uh, that I did with Hank, and uh, the reason I, I thought of him is he had done a score for a movie called Hatari, which had the most wonderful score, in particular, mm -hmm. the, the elephant walk, uh, baby elephant, I think it was called. And you had uh, Givenchy doing the clothes, because Audrey always no, worked with Givenchy. Not always, but that's well, she close. Pref she preferred it. I had asked you that nothing moved behind my title, but you didn't listen to me. Well, you got your name on it twice. That's it's enough. True. I I told Maurice Binder exactly what to do. I could have done it without him, actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean he nice. he showed me what he had in mind. I may have had some input. I don't remember what I did. Peter will probably say I did nothing. This is Megève, uh, a town in the French Alps. And we went there with the troupe to this hotel. And this hotel um, was not yet open. It was owned by the Rothschilds, and it was a new luxury hotel, and it was still a week or so away from its official opening. Um, that shot of the gun there is a, is a lie because that's right. it's actually a, a grown-up's hand. That's because the, you know, who's the assistant director? It's Mark's hand. I remember that well. But that's real water on her face. Oop, yeah, see, if we had a child's hand, you would have known it was a child's hand. And so we would have given away the joke. Given away the joke. But this hotel was very, was very luxurious and uh, quite and, lovely. And not yet open. Right. And, um, and when we arrived, it had a little waiting pool in the lobby, and Cary Grant put his foot right into the waiting pool. And there was a real pool, which you'll see in a minute, an enclosed pool, an indoor pool. And the only people who were staying at the hotel, as I remember, were Romy Schneider and um, Alain Delon, who were carrying on something of an affair at that time. They were staying there, although, uh, so they were in the swimming pool. Hmm, I don't remember that. Well, hard for me to forget Romy Schneider. It is infuriating that your unhappiness does not turn too fast. There's the pool. But I don't understand. Why do you want a divorce? All right. This picture wasn't really based on a book. There was a book based on an original screenplay. I wrote an original screenplay with, uh, with attached to nobody. Anyway, the agent submitted it to Hollywood, to seven studios, and they all seven had turned it down. I was not, uh, I'd never had a film made before. They all turned it down. And so um, 
I didn't know what to do, so my wife suggested I turn it into a book that was long, as it always is. There was a lot of description of Paris and other things. So I turned it into a book. And the minute the book was published, seven wasn't, studios in Hollywood uh, made offers for it. It wasn't same, exactly published. It ran in Red Book well, magazine. It was then. It was also published. It, Red Book, Red Book actually printed, could not was not allowed to print more than forty five percent of it or some number. But there was a book, and the book came out. But it was bought by Stanley from the Red Book magazine. So were the studios the author. I'm now going to get a, a shot of uh, how what kind of man I am. But the no, Red no, Book, no, no, Red no, book was what I yeah, read. It was right. sent to me by Peter's agent, and uh, that's what I read. All the studios saw it in Red Book, too, and did it. And I went with Stanley for three reasons. One, I'd had a show open on Broadway, which uh, had promised to be a big hit and was not. And uh, I was sick of New York. I knew that with Stanley making it, it would be shot in Paris, not in Hollywood, and that's where it really had to be set. So I was very anxious to go there. The other thing was he got actors, that he got stars, he attracted stars. And since I'd written this for Audrey Hepburn and Cary Grant, and he had worked with both of them, he did, um, of course, Funny Face with Audrey, and he'd already done Indiscreet and The Grass is Greener with Cary. So I figured he'd have a good chance of getting them if they were gettable. And third... He was the only one who hadn't seen it before, and I had scruples in those days, which had long gone. But I had them in those days, and it seemed less... Uh, hadn't seen the book before, cynical. or the script. Yes, so it seemed to me that, that I wanted to sell it to somebody who wasn't... Uh, uh, who had some integrity about this thing, and that was Stan. In fact, I never saw that script. That's true, although you did without realizing it, because that's when I well, sat down you probably wrote sat, it. That's why you were reading the magazines <laughs> in the back office. You weren't writing at all. I had never met Stanley. He was living in England, and um, I, however, knew his work, which was terribly sophisticated. The musicals, of course, but then I saw such things as Indiscreet and The Grass is Greener and, and those pictures that had enormous high, high style. I chose Stanley because I said, first of all, cross between the high style and the ability to get the stars I wanted for it, that was an ideal thing. Look at that riding. nice Louis Vuitton luggage. Isn't it beautiful? They loaned it to us. We had no, to give they it back. Did not. You had to buy it? My luggage. Oh, who ended up with it? Me. Oh, of course, the director. I keep forgetting. I mean, this was a set built on the sound. Isn't stage. it beautiful? Isn't she beautiful? And are her clothes beautiful? This was a set, actually, to the art director's chagrin. He hated it. I, I said, I want a real apartment. A he real... wanted to design an apartment. We actually rented these walls, which for, were for sale, all this wazerie, and just stood it up in the studio and rented those fireplaces, and uh, that's how the set came into being. Everyone who says Audrey was so skinny, she was so thin. She had three copies of everything she wore, and... Afterwards, uh, my wife, who was with me then and who had been uh, at that time a model with uh, Vogue, uh, put in for the clothes and they hung off her, not because she was thinner than Audrey, she wasn't, but because Audrey was a large woman. She had big bones, she was broad shouldered in spite of her thinness. She was tall and, um, and substantially built. I hate to disagree, but I didn't think she was tall. I mean, she was not too tall for Fred Astaire, and he's not a tall man. Oh, but she's 5'8". Never. You don't think so? No. Standing on her money, she was. Yes. All right. Jacques Marin, this Very, actor. very good actor, but he, he it's not his voice. You're positive? You love him? I love this shot. I actually wrote this shot, and Stanley... You can't write a shot, Peter. I described it in the script, and Stanley, one of the few directors I ever worked with in my life, actually took a suggestion from a screenwriter. They don't read stage Not directions. Not many. No, they don't read stage directions, you know. They think it interferes with their... But Marin is dubbed by an actor named Coco... Aslan. Aslan, who's really a good actor also. Not, it's not his name, Coco. No, Gregoire is Gregoire, his name. yeah. But everybody called him Coco. 
but he was fluent in English and French, Coco. Everybody calls Chanel Coco, too, so they didn't get mixed up. That's right. You all the time would say, send for Coco, and then Chanel, and Chanel, Chanel, Chanel would come. And, and um, this Jacques was a little difficult to understand. He spoke somewhat of English, and so uh, he, he seemed to look right for the party audition, and he and was what, good. what the French call a bon type. He, he, was, he, was, he was the right kind of man you wanted for. He, aggra- he got aggravated very well. I remember one day uh, at lunch, I came back from lunch, and in my chair were his notes for his part because he didn't really speak English, and he had written out the part phonetically, and every time he said I, he had written A-I-L, which means garlic in but French, pronounced, but pronounced, but pronounced I. I, so that's how he learned to say I. I had worked with him before on a... Garlic uh, had worked for him before. Also, No, I had worked with him before on another thing, before a, a television pilot for... Uh-huh. He was, he was very good and very nice. The authorities in Bordeaux searched this compartment on the train. They searched it thoroughly. They did not find $250,000. Nothing shall be said about this, Peter. Well, they, people will have seen it already. So Nothing he, will be said about oh, this. All right. All right. But the people who are listening to this will have seen the film. They're, they're now running it to hear this if they choose. Jardin des Champs Élysées. Why there? I don't know. So I am I take direction. I'm not I'm not to speak of this. The thing that you're not to speak of, don't speak of. Right. All right. One letter, stamped but unsealed. Address. Here the whole picture could have been over in this very moment, right here and now, as we cut to this, we could have ended the movie. You were <coughs> I was careful not to you do it. You were very careful, but you were more careful than I was willing to be. I, I, I trusted it. The idea, after all, it was, it was the whole idea of the whole picture. It's right there in that it's shot. It's right there, and I trusted it. Well, I, now we're not to tell what that is because it'll no. ruin the picture well, for the people I, I who are figure, listening. I figure everybody who's listening has just seen it. Well, the that's not true. I mean, they listen to us before they saw it? As they see it. And you can hear the movie and this at well, the same time. Anyone who would do that without having seen the movie ahead of time... Um, Go away. I don't want to even talk to that person. Turn it off. Watch the movie. One toothbrush. One tin of tooth powder. That is all. Any case, I said this is the whole gimmick, and if it won't work in the movie, it wouldn't have worked in the story. You write a mystery for people in your mind. You write the movie to be seen a second time. And if someone looks at it the second time and says, oh, that's a cheat, then you haven't made it right. They got to look and say, my gosh, it was available all the time and I didn't see it. And that's what you're after. That's what you try to do. Well, they can do that in this movie. Yes. I shot it like that. Yes, exactly. That's the point. But don't tell them what it is. I won't, but they all know what it is. They don't all know what all, it is. All know it right now. I thought it was a good story when I read it, and that's what appealed to me. In fact, I happened to happen to be specifically looking for an action-adventure romantic picture in which the female was the leading role. And lo and behold, along came this story, which in Red Book was called The Unsuspecting Wife. They changed it. Now, here's what's interesting about this shot. Yes, the The light came, the tape on his ears. Tape on the back of his ears. Because light came through it and he had red red ears. He had glowing red ears because the light went through it. Because he was backlit. So he had to put masking tape on on his ears uh, to keep the light from showing through. It's 37 years ago, and I remember, it's funny what you can remember. Almost everything as you look at images. Things I wouldn't have remembered if I didn't look at images. It's amazing it's 37 years ago, and I'm only 40 years old. As I know, it is, but you were a prodigy. And the amount of smoking that went on in those days in movies. Look how gorgeous she is. Doing what? I'm a simultaneous translator, like Sylvie. Only she's English into French, and I'm French into English. That's what I was doing before I married Charles. The police probably think I killed him. I think there's a thing about Carrie, and that is he somehow has a kind of of universal, a small u, universal existence that fits any period or any time. 
Um, he's modern. No matter when you look at it, he's modern. We'll find you a hotel. And they're so stunning. They're so stunning together. Something clean and modest. And near enough to your rest go so that you can take a cab when it rains. Okay? Okay. You can see it's an old movie by seeing the record drop down on a player. Oh, is that it what that is? I've forgotten even what those are. Wouldn't be such a thing today. No. This is, in many ways, my favorite scene in the, in the picture. Then you can go home after this. After this, I'll go home, leave yeah. it to you. Not a very large turnout, is it? It's an interesting way of introducing characters. It has a lot of individual little gimmickry to it that was a little quirks and things. It just was a... I'd never seen one like it. And, and so, you know. And Stanley shot it so well. Naturally. This I like. You think instance. he's actually, but there he is clipping yes, his nails. Yes. Thought he, they're saying he knew you how just to gave behave it away. at now, funerals. How come you could, didn't no, I didn't say it away. until after oh, he did all right, it. All right. If you noticed my timing. That's true. But uh, they're saying he knows how to behave at funerals, and uh, yeah. you see he's clipping his nails. Now the, the cast arrives one by one and displays. Look how well lit and shot that is. That's Ned Glass, Ned, who's sneezing. Yeah. Ned Glass, who's, he's allergic to him. Uh, Ned Glass was a character actor. He was blacklisted uh, for a long time. And he became, he, t he got an alternate, see, actors had the toughest time, directors too, being blacklisted because uh, they couldn't, their face. They couldn't have pseudonyms. Right. And so he became a carpenter. And he learned how to be a carpenter by building his own house. He built a house for himself. Yeah. And he survived during those years. If he was a good enough carpenter, he could have been Harrison Ford. That's right. Uh, anyway, Jimmy Coburn had... Uh, everybody loved him in The Magnificent Seven. Rangy, interesting face, interesting voice. Tell this story about the mirror under the nose, Carrie. There you go, you tell it. Carrie, Carrie said to me, that, that thing is no good, the, the, putting the mirror under his nose. Nobody will understand what he's doing. And I said, I think they will, Carrie. I think they'll get that he's seeing if the man is breathing in the coffin to see if he's really dead. So we, we went to Russia's, and somebody had their daughter who was about five, six years old. And uh, he... He looked at the little girl and he said, you see that? Just, yeah, I said, what's that man doing? She said, he's putting a mirror under his nose to see if he's still breathing. <laughs> he's a five-year-old. Oh, yeah. Now, George Kennedy, who had been had made a hit as a villain in a, in a couple of pictures because he was enormous, I mean, and still is. He's enormous, sir. Yes. Now. But, but he was, he's tall and he's, he's just a big guy. I think Lonely the Brave he'd been in and a couple of other things. And uh, he's a perfect choice for this character. What next? Now this I like, because where you found this guy, I don't know. Pardon, but, Madame. Pardon, Madame. Pardon. Yes, he was, he, was, he was scary, and yet he turns out to be a very pleasant fellow. That's the last we ever see him. Never see him again. Never worked again. No. This picture was it. Oh, this is funny about the... Uh, I can tell that. We said, where are the CIA offices in Paris? And somebody said, I think they're in Wait there. Wait there's me. That's you and my voice. It's, it's my face and, and my Stanley's voice. voice. And there I am telling a story that happened. Oh, my God. I'm, who's that young, attractive looking? Oh, go ahead. Anyway, so they said, the CIA, I think it's in the American embassy. So I said, all right. And I called the American embassy and I said, uh, just called the regular number. I said, may I speak to the CIA, please? He said, we're not allowed to tell they're here. <laughs> <laughs> That's cute. And there he is. There's Matthau. Right. A young Matthau. He had not yet become a movie star no. at that point. Look how beautiful she is. Look how unbeautiful he is. No, no, he's very cute. Lambert. Excuse me for a moment, Mrs. Lambert. A stubborn little devil. Dry cleaning wise, things are all fouled up. I had a good man, a really excellent man, on the Rue Pont too, 
But HQ asked us to use the plant here. In the anyway, he um, he was a champion at various little things. For instance, he will sniff this lighter fluid and make a face. And, and he just threw things like that away, but made sure. Now watch, watch him when he does it. <laughs> What's funny is putting it back in his pocket. Yes, and the face. The fa liverwurst, 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 and chicken. Chicken. No, thank you. Mrs. Lampert, do you know what CIA is? I don't suppose it's an airline, is it? Central Intelligence Agency, CIA. Well, he should have been funny. I don't, he, I don't remember what I don't was remember in the book. either in the book. I but haven't read he it. he should have been funny because you shouldn't know that he's not funny. Yeah. And so, oh, and, 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 and the fact is... That's, I'm that's trying it. to not I give the plot are. away. Anyway, he is clearly written funny. I mean, here. Uh, and uh, he, he's written to be funny. So it was written that way before Mathau. I think Mathau was gotten because it was supposed to be funny and also because he was disarming. See, that's called holding a glass up in the frame. Otherwise, if he held it where he's supposed to hold it, it wouldn't have been in the frame. No, he could hold it where he held it. Well, it not That's really. not a close shot. It was closer than it, higher than it would have been. May I have a sandwich, please? I saw him in uh, Lonely of the Brave, I believe, and mm -hmm. thought he was terrific. And, he was. And, uh, and uh, cast him. Also, I didn't want anybody who was extremely well known to the audiences and I, he was not yet w well known to audiences film audiences All right, Mrs. Voss. Well, it not... was in the book she she when she was terribly nervous she ate and um, oh by the way have you seen this one and it's funny about the eating of the sandwiches because he will start to eat sandwiches in a minute and this sequence shot it took a day and a half or something. No, I doubt not. Well, it took the whole day. And he must have eaten, I think, I'm not exaggerating, must have eaten 40 or 50 of those little sandwiches in the course of, of shooting this whole sequence. He said to me, can I eat a sandwich during this speech? I said, sure. Yeah. I, said, I, said, he said, I said, why do you want to do that? He said, because I'm funny when I chew. And he is. He's yeah. funny when he chews. Now, making young pictures of the older actors is good, too. They had to be given. You'll have to be a little clearer than that. Nobody will know what you're talking about. Well, for about. instance, there's a toupee on Ned, because he's supposed to be younger. Make him younger than he was in the rest of the film. Right. But the picture moves, not the... No, the camera moves. Yeah, it I zooms in. I, I actually that. made the shot like you saw it with the magnifying glass. By then, we had zoom lenses. I believe we had zoom lenses. Oh, we did, yes. because there was another there zoom lenses later. This is right, but I'm very much afraid that you are in a great deal of danger. Why should I be in any danger? You're Charles Voss's wife. But he uh, managed to make this... Um, funny. Funny, because it, it, there's a tremendous amount of exposition in this shot, in this whole sequence, because this is the whole backstory is in this. And in order to make the backstory interesting, there had to be things going on and so so if you watch his he is funny eating you have to admit it yeah his mouth is funny mm -hmm. he's also said to me in later sequence you have to be careful when i'm running because he's, it's not supposed to be funny when he's running and he said i, I look funny when i, I run. can't help it he says he I, said, I, I'm I, funny I run when, funny yeah, yeah and he does he's he runs like a duck Ours. Charles Voss stole $250,000 from the United States government. I'm afraid we want it back. Mark Bem, uh, he was a madman with plots. He could, he could plot. He had came up with a new script. He could write a script overnight, and he had 50, 60 of them. Almost none of them was ever produced. But later on, he did write one of the Beatles pictures, uh, the second Beatle picture. And uh, he uh, and I worked this uh, story out together. And then he didn't. He went off in, in his own world, in his own life, and um, and I went on and wrote the script. Even though I had had Audrey in mind when I wrote the script, I did realize that she'd never done anything like this before. In other words, had never been in jeopardy, which is what she is throughout the picture. But on the other hand, nobody had really made a picture like this in a great number of years, except for Carrie, who had done the Hitchcocks, where he had been in that position 
Almost nobody else had any experience doing this. So I figured Audrey, after having seen her range from Nun's story to Tiffany, it would certainly be... And also, I found her very vulnerable on screen, and vulnerable is what this Jeopardy called for. So I was perfectly confident that she was right for it. Uh, she went on to play it a couple more times, but up until this time, she hadn't really done that sort of thing. I think that's what appealed to her, too, about doing it. What happened is uh, I thought I had Cary Grant and Audrey Hepburn, and then uh, we were at Columbia, and uh, Carrie said, no, I'm not going to be in it. I don't want to be in it. I've changed my mind. I'm not going to do it. And, and she so, said she'd only do it if Carrie would If Carrie it. did it, yeah. So the picture collapsed, and Columbia dropped it in that terrible word. The picture was in turnaround. This was the real, this is the real place. They're standing in the actual play. I love the kids' faces in this. This is such a tradition in France, the guignol. The, the Guignolet. Yeah, well, that was the name of the theater, but it's called guignol. And, and, and um, uh, it's the uh, Punch and Judy show, and it's a morality tale. And because it has the policeman in it always, having the policeman come here and mimic, mirror what's going on in the, in the story was... Yeah, if you saw that shot, it said Guignolet above That's it. because that's the, the name of the theater. The vrai Guignolet. That's the name of the theater, yeah. but the This is form, not the Guignol. This it is, it's the not Guignol. Not the Grand Guignol. No, that's another theater. Yeah. This is, this is, this this is form. This is the Guignolet. No, no, that's the name of the little theater. The name of this form is Guignol. That means the Guignol is a puppet show, a, punch, a hand puppet show. How about making me vice president in charge of cheering you up? Starting tonight? Now, this is interesting because... I hope it is interesting. Well, it is. There's Monty Landis. His real name is Max Lundstein, and he's from uh, Scotland. Is and he still with us? I think so. I see him occasionally. Yeah. He was a comedian in Paris. He did uh, what they call a fantasiste. He did pantomime and he, he mouthed records. Uh, he did a record act and he did it in all the esoteric clubs, the Rose Rouge and the Fontaine de Quatre Saisons. And he was very, and he worked at the Crazy Horse Saloon. He was very popular there. And he's, this, he did this. He was a natural MC. And this is a game I saw when I first moved to Paris when I was 19 years old, I went to a nightclub and they played this game. This is an actual game they love to play, little audience participation. This is where you and I have a different memory of this game. Well, that's where I first saw it, so but, I put it in the original novel. But this game, I, I, I played at Gene Kelly's house, and I remember playing I'm, I'm it sure well with, uh, with Dorothy Dandridge. Mm -hmm. She and I, I had to take the orange from her, which was, I can mm. tell you, a pleasure. I'm sure we have no different memory. Yeah. I mean, it went into the into the original book because I had played it at the, as a as a young person. Who is she? I don't know her name. She was very funny, very funny. Yeah, I first that, had cast that a was gorgeous the, the, girl. This girl was the was the girlfriend of the makeup man. It's not uh, not a Borman. I somebody. had first cast a be beautiful, big bosomed young girl in this part, and just before we started to shoot, I thought, gee, it's not funny if it's a gorgeous girl with a big bosom, get an older lady. Thank God I did. Well, she does Margaret Dumont great. She I does mean, it wonderfully, yeah. Deadpan, and it's very funny. This is the scene the Cuban Missile Crisis was happening when we shot it. And I remember and we all well. thought the world was coming to an end. And at a certain point one afternoon, you just stopped, and we all went to the canteen and said, what are we doing? The world's about to blow up. Why are we screwing around with, with fun and games? The world's going to be ending. Let's wait and see what happens. And you suspended shooting a little early that day. And we sat there in the canteen watching television, which was up over the, over the bar at the studio. It's not a bad movie when you just look at their faces. No, it's, it's, I'm, I'm, it's true. Now Just there's... a lot of shots of their faces will do. Now, one has to say that when we, in Megève, in, in France, the weather was terrible. It was mist and snow and mist and snow. We sat there for a very long time without being able to shoot. So Stanley 
sent for some of the sets in Paris uh, and had them shipped to Megev, and there was a garage he found where he set the sets up in the garage, and we shot a lot of the movie there. And the reason I'm saying this now is the next, this. This is in the garage. Is in, in the garage Megev. in Megev, this shot. The There's scene. More. The whole scene, yeah. Also, the later part in mm -hmm. the CIA back I, office is in the And movie. I think the downstairs at the at the American Express? No. Something, there big. is one other shot that was done there. But this was this all This whole done. sequence was, was done, done in the, the garage, garage yeah. in Because While we were waiting for the weather to, to, to clear up. These sets were built in Paris, and then they were shipped ready, the so garage. they just shipped them down, and we put them up in the garage. Howdy. Want. When I cast Jim Carver, they all came in for auditions as well as a lot of other people. A lot of them weren't na I mean, weren't, weren't famous they weren't, enough. To they be... weren't famous at all. Coburn wasn't, and neither was George Kennedy. Now, there's a good moment to mention that I, I, I'm talking about you were dropping those matches on one. It's fair to say that's not her lap. No, it's her lap. In the you know, When they cut to the inside? Yes, it's her lap. That was for good Givenchy's that he was dropping them on. Well, it belongs to me, Miss Lambert, and you're going to get it for me. Anyway, um, the point is that I'm talking about the sets and Mijev and the thing as if it's normal for me to be there. Stanley let me be there for... I didn't for, let you. Well, I wanted you there. Well, I suppose uh, for the entire movie from beginning to end, which for me was like a college course because it was my first film. And um, I, um, I really enjoyed every minute of it. I except, wish I the, did. except the except uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. I'm having a nervous breakdown. You enjoyed it. Well, I suppose uh, having you and Carrie and Audrey together was um, enough to keep me uh, amused. The anxiety of making a movie is is horrendous. How, how does this stand on on uh, on, on the, the scale of uh, on the horror scale? Yes. Oh no, this is fine on the horror scale. It's just the problem of getting it done on time, that's all. And yeah. if you don't finish on time, the actors get a million dollars a minute uh, overtime, and, uh, and then the picture will be a, uh, a loss. So you have to be able to organize yourself and how you're going to make it in order to get it done quickly. Even if I'm not the producer, I have to think about it. That's why I became a producer. It's, it's, it's the director's problem to get it done on time, whether he's a producer or not. So you may as well be the producer. Um, I noticed the other day when I happened to catch Indiscreet again that there's this elevator scene with Cary Grant and uh, Ingrid Bergman facing yes. each other in an elevator going up. Yes. This Not is sort exactly of, like this. No, though. but is are you doing homage to your Hardly, first shot? Hardly, no. <laughs> Hardly. <laughs> I like that idea. Yeah. Homage to myself. Yes, I yes. like that. First floor. Here you are. Where? On the street where you live. How about once more around the park? How about getting out of here? Come on, child, out. Two lines that um, everybody used when Carrie, for Carrie's obituary. One in the elevator, which was, she touches his How chin. do you shave in there? Mm -hmm. And the other one was right, is, is, is this coming is up best, in one second. This is the best line about Carrie ever written, right here. It's when she goes. Yeah. She doesn't go, he goes. Yeah, but I mean, when she's about to turn to go into a room, here it is. Here's, you know what's wrong with you. You know what's wrong with you. No, what? Nothing. 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 And that's and the truth. Know, something is true. Nothing is wrong with him. We had great adventures with Carrie, and later we'll, uh, it's worth talking about. <laughs> Where is it, Lee? I don't know. His disability. It's actually an, look, look, uh, look, look. actually an ability. It gives yeah. him an extra bit of fright. Nicely lit, traveling from below, looking menacing. You give it to me. It's mine. Ooh. Oh, Peter! Peter! A man tried to kill he didn't me. Get far. He didn't get far. No. I, I didn't think he got very far. He didn't far. get he far. Was slow. Well, he Fortunately, he didn't go quickly That's because otherwise right. he wouldn't have been in the rest of the scene. Or she would, Bobby might not have survived. That's right, no movie. No movie. But fortunately, he was a slow descender.
Although I don't know how he got back up. He took the elevator. Oh no, he missed it. Well, we didn't yeah. see. No, how yes, he, you did. We don't see how he got down. He yes, could have you waited. Do. No, no, you do see how he got down because he stands. He turns to the elevator, and, and it's, it's gone. gone. It. He goes, uh, and then he starts for the stairs. And he doesn't. The, the what he doesn't do is start for the stairs. Well, we, in my we know in your that. head, he starts yes, for the stairs. Yes. Mm, I spray my pride. How are you? Scared. You'll be all right. Where did he go? Out the window, I guess. Well, lock the door. Don't let anyone... Could have walked around it, but he didn't. And close these windows after me. Be careful. Look at that. Out the window. You'd never know that's... Paris. Yes. <laughs> A reasonable fact. It's, it's made in Paris. Oh, look at that. Go ahead. Try it. Now, this you're about to see from below. Carrie had a stuntman double. And he went with him from movie, there he is. And he went with him from movie to movie, and he was a nice guy. And he didn't really look like him, but I'll he had I'll give this... you money if you know his name. Uh, let me think for a minute. Well, and... I'll tell you his name, uh, Saul Gorse. That's right. I, was, I, I just thought of it. Oh, thank yeah. you. And uh, <laughs> he, he followed Carrie from picture to picture with Carrie. I mean, he went with Carrie. He didn't look like him particularly, but he was the same his color. His shape looked his like His shape, him. and he moved the way Carrie did. And here he goes again. Ugh. And um, and if Saul had fallen, I could keep shooting. But if Carrie fell, it would have been a disaster. That's right. Although we would have had to cut out the other, the other stunts if Saul had fallen. He was married to a a lady that I had gone to high school with, who was also a stunt lady. But I had gone to high school in in. Beverly Hills as a as a young person. Never mind that. Did you get the money? How could I with the three marks? This the plot turns yep, here. This is there's a lot of plot. A lot turning. of plot lot turning of here now. That's right. Now the girl trusts me. If she's got the money. And um, Carrie is... actually thought, if you notice in the picture, that he had a good side and a or a better side than the other side. I didn't really agree with him, but I did my best to keep him but on the right, side he liked. He liked this right is side. the way he liked. With the right side. With him showing. on the left looking toward the right of the screen. And uh, it was easy to remember because he always got top billing, so I would always say your name would be on the left and your face would be on the left. Which put poor George's face on the right, but George didn't care. Also, George looked the same from... Carrie but looked great on both sides. Carrie looked good from either side, as did Audrey. Did she have a favorite side? No. Interesting thing is you once, I believe you told me you had a leading man, or maybe it was Carrie and Ingrid or somebody, who both liked the same side of their face. Uh, it must have been another director, uh, not me. You never had no. Somebody told me they had two actors, and they both wanted, wanted to face the, same, the same way. Face the same way, and so all of their love shoot scenes, one of them in a mirror. No, what happened was that... The, the, the gentleman always came up and put his arms around her from behind, and that way they could talk into her. But Forward. Yes, yeah, so yeah. they were both facing in the same direction so he could shoot them. More plot. More plot, but... Now he's deceiving the poor Audrey. Yes. He's done that. He's doing well, it now. Now he's, he's going to do it. it. He's going back in and lie to her. Yes. And, and suddenly he shot differently. That's what was interesting, because... But now we're, we're, we don't believe him. And so there's menace in what he does. And when he hugs her, you know, coming up soon, his face is such that, not this time, but the next time, um, his face is such that you, it's shot in a way to make it look like he could be guilty. There's actually subtext to the, to the, to the shot. Why don't you confide in me? And tell me what the Carrie about. either intuited or knew that it didn't matter whose clothes he wore, when they got on him, they always looked fabulous. It was like the haircut. No matter who chopped it up, it always looked great. So he was perfectly content. I mean, you have to understand, Kerry came from grinding poverty in Europe, and he, you know, uh, people used to say he was tight with a dollar. He was careful with a dollar. And, and because he had come where, where, dollar, where, where pennies meant things. And he figured out that he could buy his clothes at, uh, from anyone, you know, even botany, or not a, even botany, but like botany, and it would look great on him. See, that's the moment when they embrace. 
and he wasn't adverse to even uh, making a little contract with Botany since he was doing it, uh, which would give him the clothes for free. So not only were they reasonably priced, they were very reasonably priced. I, I don't want to uh, do calumny on Botany, but it's a lower end of the line clothes. But it didn't make any difference when he put them on. When he, but no matter what he put on, it looked like he was wearing tailored suits. Hello? Mrs. Lambert, it's me, the man who was in your room a few minutes ago. We were in Mejev, and we couldn't work because it was misty. We went walking in the town, he and I. And suddenly he says, I'm going to get a haircut. I said, what? He, and there was a little shop on the main street. Who? I mean, just a, a, a local French barber. And I said, you can't do that. I mean, you got to shoot. I mean, he's going to butcher. You don't know. It does, yes, it doesn't make any difference. And he went in, he got a haircut, and it didn't make any difference. You couldn't destroy it. It was, it was, it was indestructible. When, after he died, he and I had become very friendly, and I was friendly with him until he died. And somebody said, did you ask him to put in his will when he died to leave you his clothes? And I said, no, I, I, I didn't really want his clothes. I wanted his hair. <laughs> But this hack barber in Mejev, a Frenchman who, you know, who, who learned in a catalog how to be a bar or whatever, cut away and cut away, and he came out looking spectacular when he came out of there. Well, he looked like that. Well, it's going to hurt. I know. Try to get some sleep. You'll feel better. But don't worry. I've arranged to take the room next door to you. There, her face, because she knows now. Yeah, and, she and suspects he's That he's villain. somebody... When Carey accepted the role, he had only one condition, and the condition was that the writer had to come and sit and meet with him for a couple of days and hear what he had in mind. Now, here he goes. This was hard. This was written, but it was very hard to do because no one believed it. That's a tie pin. That's a tie pin, and now he's going to unravel a sock, but socks don't unravel. I don't know. Well, they know. can. They can. They, they have knitted socks. If, they especially can. if they're written into the script. They actually did unravel there. Yeah, you're right. Something. Anyway, so I, I was in Europe, so I came back to New York, and went. he wanted me to stay at the Plaza Hotel where he was staying. And I took a cab, went by my own apartment, which was in New York, very strange feeling, to the Plaza Hotel. To live in a hotel in a town where you have an apartment is an odd feeling. And I went up there, and we, I spent two and a half, three days in the suite of his suite with him arguing over certain things in the script, which when we get to punt one of them, we'll talk about it. But, but I, uh, we argued about it and argued and argued, and finally it's the, I just couldn't take it anymore. I said, I don't care what happens. Uh, I, I want him to do it. I said, all right, never mind. We'll take the scene out. He said, well, now, wait a minute. Let's talk about it. And suddenly I realized something about him, that there are certain things he wanted to do, but he didn't want to be responsible for having done them. And so as long as it was my idea, and he couldn't be blamed for it. And, um, and he, it was interesting, because it came up again and again, that same idea. The main thing he wanted was that he said, I cannot chase this girl. I am too old, she is too young, I cannot chase this girl. She must, in some way, be chasing me. Not because, and you'd say, and anybody else, you'd say, oh, how, how conceited, the girl chased him, but that's not at all what he meant. What he meant was it's unseemly, for, he thought, for a man his age uh, to be chasing, to be actually coming on to a young girl. And he wanted the young girl to be the one who encouraged the relationship, basically. That's the better way to put it. And he was insistent upon it. He would have been a fool not to chase Audrey Hepburn, but she would have been a fool not to chase him. Right. But he turned 60 during the making of this picture, although he doesn't look it. Now, they are in a section of Paris which doesn't exist anymore. The section's there, of course, but this thing isn't there, and that's the market layout. And uh, layout the halls is what it meant. And they had all these various sheds called halls where they sold everything from meat to cheese to vegetables to fruit and everything else, fish. And people in Paris used to go there at 2 in the morning, 3 in the... High society in, in dinner clothes would go there because there were certain restaurants, the Piet Cochon, other restaurants, where you'd go and have onion soup in the morning at 3, 4 in the morning. But this place, this was the... 
Zola in one of his novels called this the, the womb of Paris, the belly of Paris, um, where all of the food, they've moved it outside the city limits now to an area on the way to the Orly Airport. But, but it, and this has become an arts center. The new Pompidou Museum is there and uh, a lot of restaurants and places. But onion soup is not exactly described the kind of onion soup no. you had. It was a. It was you know with the delicious cheese with on cheese top on of, top. Yeah, the yeah. gratiné. It was yeah. fabulous. Anyway, that's where this whole scene took place. Any. Well, I mean, that's where it's, the scene was supposed to take place. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, mm-hmm. those early shots were there. Yeah, but not this no, scene. No, not this. No. This was a well, set. set. The studio, but I like the towel work behind her. The original script was a lot less of that, this many locations, but when I changed it into the novel, so I, I, I made it kind of a travelogue of, of the city, and so there, I tried to put it in as many sections of the city as I could. And they kept them. They're, they're there, you know. They ride down the Seine, and there's a tourist there's, attraction. They, they there's do the, the, bateau, the, the bateau mouche. mouche. Right, which they do. But right. we're in the subway, which you don't usually do. Yeah, well, this is a story either. taking place in Paris. Right. It's but not we, a... It's not also a movie I, about showing Paris. The sets were in the, in the sets were built in a studio. Bologna, uh, which is on the south, on the Seine, uh, on the river, just just at the city limits, the southern city limits of Paris. Sort of near ye. Yeah. There's the onion There's soup. There's the onion soup right there. Right there. That's what it looked like. That is it. Could it have been made in a studio in Hollywood? Obviously not. If you wanted to show Paris, it had to be made in Paris. This movie, as it turned out, was uh, a co-production in a way. It was a Universal and a Stanley Donnan production. They each owned half the laundry ticket. Well, that's the way every film is made. No, no producer today, right? But in those in the earlier days, not and Universal. The only, the only producers who ever actually financed their films totally were Sam Goldwyn and David Selznick. Right, but in the studio days, and Universal was the last studio to remain in the studio system. In the studio days, every picture was made entirely by the studio. The producers were under contract. Uh, and the, every, the directors were under contract, and the stars were under contract, and everybody was under 52-week contract. And yes, but by the time we did charade, no that question. was no longer true. No question. It was, begin, it was beginning to be no longer true. I mean, there was still, Universal was still making Universal pictures. Oh, yes, but I mean, there were, there were a number of pictures yeah. that weren't made in no that question. way. No um, question. I don't know what an independent film or a studio film is. There are just movies that people make, and you fight it out, Every inch of the way as you go along, and then that's the movie that it gets that gets done. I just wanted to do a movie where the leading lady was the one who was being chased all through the film instead of the man, which was the thing at the moment that was happening. Like North by Northwest, where Carrie was the one who was yeah. in trouble. This is more like suspicion. Yeah, except it's funny. Well, that was my interest. It had been many, many years since. That's, a, that's the hard part, is to do the mystery, the adventure, and the humor. Well, they all hadn't in the tried world. it in a very long time. And, and, you know, it's called black comedy, and it, it hadn't been a successful one since really the late 30s. And it interested me as a genre that, to do suspense and menace side by side with comedy. And uh, that it's was. It's interesting the, to call it black comedy today because today it's, right. it's white comedy that's compared right. to what is black comedy, which reminds me of the story about the murdered bodies, which maybe we should tell at the point they show up in the That's movie. right. I, I'm saving that. Yeah. Oddly, there was the belief that this was a genre that was popular. It wasn't because no one was making them, not even Hitchcock's, really. That is to say, a murder mystery with, with, with legitimate comedy. Certainly there were moments of fun in Hitchcock, no question. Well, they tried. They tried. Uh, to make uh, at comedy, uh, m- m- you know, adventure movies. Most of them failed. I can't remember any off the top of my head. Well, they were too exaggerated. They were sort of Damon Runyon is what they had before, type stories where everybody was very extravagant. Uh, the characters were extravagant, and it was sort of mythic, not real people. I can't remember if this is made before North by Northwest or after. After. This is after. Yeah. 
I remember when when we finished the script that I was very nervous that it wasn't going to survive, and Peter and I ran three Hitchcock movies. That was one of them, I think. That's how I remember uh, that. I, was after. I, I, I don't remember that it was, but I remember one was uh, Rear Window, yeah, and one was Vertigo, I think. And, uh, and then I said, no, ours is certainly in the ballpark. The studio was quite worried about that because there hadn't been anything quite like it in some time. And um, then a lot of people started making them. Yes? Good morning, Mr. Dial. Reggie? It's the only name I've got. How about you? I know Cat and Mouse. You've got me. What do you want to know? Why you Columbia was my uh, film company, which was backing my company to make uh, Charade. And I thought I had Cary Grant and Audrey Hepburn, and Audrey said she'd play with Cary, and Cary said yes. And then Cary changed his mind, and then Audrey said she didn't want to do it without Cary, and she went into other pictures, and the, Columbia, uh, under the aegis of Mike Frankovich, under his aegis, said they wouldn't, wanted to make the picture with Warren Beatty and Natalie Wood, and I went to Warren Beatty and Natalie Wood, and they both said, yes, they loved it, and they would do the picture. And then Mike Frankovich said, no, Columbia wouldn't do it with Warren Beatty and Natalie Wood. They changed their mind. This was after having me ask them to do it. And then they sent me a telegram saying, we're not going to make the picture. The picture is in, tel in turnaround, which is part of the original contract if it didn't get made by a certain time. So the picture was in turnaround at Columbia, and Cary Grant called me and said, uh, he had read uh, this picture he was supposed to do with Howard Hawks, and he really didn't like the script, and would, uh, would I s still be able to make the picture that I had sent him, which was charade? And I said, I, uh, absolutely. And this was, came immediately after Columbia said they didn't, didn't want to make the picture. So he called me that day. We, we got together and made an, a, a contract with Carrie, and I called Audrey, and she said she'd love to do it with Carrie. And I called Universal, and Universal took the movie in a second, and that's how it got to Universal. There's how big George Kennedy is, because Carrie is a tall man, mm -hmm. and Kennedy towers over him. Carrie was 6'2 or something. And, and look at Kennedy. Look at Kennedy. He's like 6'4, but also he's not just tall. He's a big he's fellow. Massive. But Columbia, of course, was furious when it was made with Carrie and Audrey, and they heard about it, and they said I had uh, denied telling them the truth, that Carrie was going to do it all along, and uh, we just did that so they'd get out of the picture, and uh, totally untrue. It did look like it, but there was, but, but there was still, it, you but know, it couldn't help but the truth. the truth is the truth. Now what? This, I like this expensive set. This right is a here. very expensive, yes, this, this, a gray wall. He's not a great yawner, I have to say. But the music, there was, a, as I remember, there was a little musical joke there. This yawned, doesn't happen either. Yawned. What does it? Closing they wouldn't the place close up? up the place with people inside. Well, they would know. They're not supposed to know, but They're of course they, they know. would know. How would they know? I believe that. I believe if you went upstairs... Sure, and, you believe it. You wrote it. Well, I did, but I think if you got up there, no one would know you were there. They don't check the building. It's a large building. You keep right on going. The view, it better be worth it. That was the most intricate set built, was the rooftop of the American Express. Because you just it, gave away that it's not real, that we didn't shoot it there. I think we could do that oh, we can with, do that. with impunity. It's built to scale, and the building you see in the distance there is actually small. It's not that far it's, away. It's no, just made it, small. That's what Peter make, means when he says scale. It looks far away because it's small, small. but it wasn't. That house over there. Oh, look, I can see a man looking at television in one of those windows. The midget. Yeah. <laughs> We joked about <laughs> hiring teeny weeny people to move around back inside those little windows behind them. And that, that sign. That sign is big. Big, American Express sign. Yeah. And it's made to look like the real sign on top of the building. It wasn't made up. Carrie, what it was that he did is very difficult to, to describe. Uh, he was 
just light on his feet. Yes, he'd been an acrobat, he'd been a dancer, but he moved with such grace, and he he handled humor so easily. And uh, Kerry was left-handed. That's why I just hit him with the left. Uh, that, that one that shot was at Carrie. the distance. From, that not was the, I don't think no, so. Sure it That's was. not. Yes, it is. You think so? I don't oh, think yes, so. Oh, yes, it's all carry. I didn't think so. That was a sped up camera there. It's not a sped up. There's no sped up camera. You see it when the camera's sped up. Uh, what was interesting about this is that Stanley, with all of his experience, had really had no no ac no action experience. I remember, and Stanley, I think, is not sure that he did, but I remember that he that he brought in a sketch artist who who sketched whose business, whose actual skill it was to sketch out these action sequences uh, in such a way as to make them. A very clear on the looking at a storyboard to see what you needed and what you had to get. Well, you know, it was done like a dance sequence, and that's something he did know a great deal about. And um, and so he he did do it that he choreographed the action is what he did. You're about to see a stunt that took goes. to figure it out. It's a good way they got this to work. Zink, 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 and now the oh. oop. Now watch what happens now. There he goes. There. Rrrr. He used there. A, a little wheel and a flint like in a cigarette lighter. It was a cigarette lighter put into the little hand, and that was those were actual the slate sparks. tiles. Yeah. Yeah. We had to overdo it so you'd see it. Here comes a big joke coming up in a minute. Yeah. Uh, express. You see Express up there? The R is out. Yeah. See, he took the elevator up. Yeah. Working with you, Peter, was torture. Yes, it was hell. Uh, it no, was we hell. got on fine. No, we we didn't know it. each other. Peter and I had never met. I bought the rights. Peter came to London where I was. my office was set up and where I was living. And we met, and, we, and we, we've been friends ever since. We joked a lot. We, we spent a lot of time laughing. We didn't fight very much. Um, I don't remember any really serious disagreement. If you have a writer who is an enormous contributor to the picture, you want him there for, you don't know why you want him. You want him for his, whatever his input can be. It can be dialogue, it can be an opinion about the scene or an actor or whatever. Most directors you, feel a little challenged by having a writer there, but in this case it turned out well because there were at least one and maybe more but one that was very, where we stopped. We actually stopped because someone said, you know, this is wrong. This oh, doesn't make sense. That remember that day? <gasps> and it was in the set. It was in the hotel lobby or the hotel court. I know it was the hotel set. Oh. And uh, there was suddenly we said, my God, this oh. is backwards. It doesn't make, it doesn't any, make sense any sense whatsoever. And I said, wait a minute. And I remember going onto the set and I sat on the step and very carefully went A, B, C, D, E, F, let's work it out, work it out. Everybody left, everybody was sent out, the actors, the cameraman, and we just sat there, and finally we worked it out and changed it. It didn't take that long. No, but it was a horrifying moment. Well, when it was a realization that we were painted ourselves into a corner. Right. Something wasn't working. I don't I no remember, longer what, remember it what it was. No. But it was, wait, there but were it so was many, clear that we were in trouble. There were so many turns and U-turns and in left the, turns and right turns. plot in the plot that one thing contradicted something and and it was glaringly yeah, obvious. I remember it had to do with Tex and it had to do with why was he on the phone. And we worked it out and rewrote it right there on the spot, which frankly, don't know what, that, that moment arrives I think quite often on the set of a picture. Well, in this kind of story, right? But uh, you don't always have a plot which is full of no. But you have other crises that happen on a set. An actor suddenly says, "I won't say that," or "I don't want to do that," or the director. And then who's there to do it? It's you know. And if the writer isn't there, somebody else does it, and that somebody else. Today, if they have the writer on the set, to be twenty-five people. That's true. They they'd have an ampersand on every <laughs> on each side of it. Yeah. <laughs> Truthful Whitefoot, but which is he? Well, why couldn't you just look at his feet? Charles Lang was one of the veteran great, great 
cameraman of Hollywood. And he has photographed more movies than any four directors put together. I, I, I wish I could list them, but they're some of the great, great movies. He was a very fine cameraman. He had where Audrey liked him. She had made a movie with him, The Nun Story, I believe. Was. Well, more than that, what was funny, she there was a cameraman that she loved, uh, who had just died, uh, a Hungarian, Kovac. Who, who, who was? No, it wasn't his name. I can't remember, I can't his, remember name. his name either. Anyway, that's she, who had that's who had done the Nun Story. Right, that guy. That guy. And what happened is that she was making a movie now, just before this started shooting. She was making a movie with Bill Holden. Paris uh, when it sizzles. Paris when it sizzles, and Charles, I guess Charlie photographed that. Yes, because what happened was she liked her dailies, and she said Charlie would be fine. They were making the picture in the same studio, and with the same. Uh, uh, and so what happened? Charlie was a very focused man, like many cameras. Because he was are. a cameraman, right? But I mean, he was really his eye was he wasn't easily distracted, and her picture. Clo her, stopped shooting on a Friday or a, and she started shooting charade on a Monday and Charlie literally was not aware immediately that the picture had changed that it was a new picture he, it took him a day or two to realize that, that's that, of course not really true but but, uh, but it's a good joke by the time we did charade he was not a young man any longer except the interestingly he just died a couple of a year or two ago yeah as but a he, very very old man yeah he was a wonderful, wonderful cameraman, and he did in, in, in black and white some absolutely fabulous movies. And But he, the reason he came with this was that she, Audrey wanted, she him. wanted him. She liked him from the earlier picture. He was a wonderful cameraman. There was no and problem. And a very nice man. No problem about having Couldn't him. Couldn't have been. He had a charming wife, Hyla. Are you a real cowboy? That voice of his was uh, is dubbed by a, by a young lady. Not such a young lady. He actually spoke English and French. She didn't know when he was speaking one, when he was speaking And that's the not other. his voice. It's actually a, a young woman who dubbed him. But he said some funny things in truth when yeah. his little airplane, he sailed his airplane. And, oh, he said, look, my airplane landed on the toit. Which means roof in French. Questions. This ain't no gay, Miss Lambert. I want that money now. Why don't you keep quiet and stop threatening the child? He hasn't got the money, and neither has Mrs. Lambert. Yeah, then who does? I don't know. This was the scene. This is the scene. This is a great scene. story with this scene. <laughs> Carrie was. This is, a, this is a very funny story with this scene. That's the most ridiculous thing I ever Listen to this man. Uh, Gary came in the morning and said, What is this scene? In this scene, he does a great... Now, look at him right now, because it's important that you look at him at this moment because of what's happening on the set. Just watch him for a second. Now, Carrie came in and he said, I'm not going to do this scene. It's all... I can't learn it. It's all exposition. Stars don't do exposition. It's a huge, long paragraph. Long scene. And I said, look, Carrie, you haven't done a mystery of this kind. You have to keep reviewing the bidding so that the audience can follow where you are. And you're the only one left who can do it because everybody else is gone. I mean, there's nobody who can do the exposition. You have to do it. I can't do it. He said, you have to. So he said, I didn't learn it. Ha, 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 ha. I didn't learn it, so therefore. I said, it's all right. I'll write it down with chalk on a, on a blackboard, and I'll hold it there. You see him there? He's not looking at them. He's looking, okay. He said, are you crazy? I said, no, I'll put it on the blackboard. So I wrote the scene out on the blackboard, and he read it. And... He began to enjoy it, right? He's, it was kind of nice. I mean, it was this was pre-idiot boards you know, in television, and and he liked it, and he and he became sort of proud of it. And we went to his, after he left the scene. Stanley played a practical joke. He got one of the actors, Ned Glass, the one with the glasses, to stay behind. Well, they were all in the shot, right? But after Carrie had gone, they said it to each other. Yeah, they, it was a it was a reverse angle. The three of them looking at one another and. <laughs> and Stanley had him stay there and do this little extra little piece. And then the at dailies, the next day at the, when they were showing the dailies, Carrie was sitting there and he was looking and he says, look, you can't tell at all. Look at that. Isn't that terrific? You can't tell at all. And at that moment, you cut to the other actors and they're saying, you're reading that off a blackboard. And he, went, <laughs> he looked, I mean, it was in the movie. And he, he didn't know what was... <laughs> but, and he was proud of himself. But he says, I'm never forget. Stars don't do exposition.
He's right, of course. Well, he's right, but in a mystery... That, uh, oh, there it is again. Uh, in a mystery... <laughs> the part Stanley won't let me talk about. Just half. Um, it's a great shirt. Now, anyway, so, so they... Um, he loved that scene with the reading off the blackboard. Now, that'd be mighty distasteful. Must be inveterate. I also had a scene which I've lost, which I sh oh, shot a special I, moment. I hate that you've lost that. Oh, there's a scene in a taxi cab later, and I had said to Carrie, in what movie did you say Judy, Judy, Judy? He said, I never said it. I said, really? He said, never. I said, well, you're going to say it for me. So I made a shot of him in a taxi cab with Audrey where he says, J for no reason at all. The end, at the end of the I scene. said to him, I'm not going to say cut at the end of the take. I'm just going to say now. And then you say Judy, 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 which he did. And then I've lost a piece of film. But he did it not as Cary Grant. He no, did he did it the as real accent. He did it as somebody imitating him. Imitating him, yeah. He did that he real... He went, Judy, Judy, Judy. He yeah. did it very extravagantly. And and it was a great piece of footage. And you, you... I lost you, it. Butterfingers. I lost you it. Nincompoo. Yes, I lost it. <laughs> now this I like. I like this shot. This is one of the few rooms with the ceiling on it because they had to make this shot. Hey, there is something. It's heavy. I found it. I found this it. This is no, set. It's a no, set, but there's a ceiling because sets don't have. And the reason sets don't have is so they put the lights up we there. Won. I don't think there was a real room in the whole picture. A real room? Let I don't think. think so. What do you mean, no? Yeah, the kid was yelling there. Up there, it's up there. Believe me, there's nothing up there. I'm showing his wrong side, incidentally. No, Look. that's his good side. Oh, right, it's the same side you're seeing, right? That's the side. That's the side. See, you'll see him on that. On this, you'll see him in camera left there. That's the side he thinks is yeah. his good Oop. side. That was an actual real one. It's a real one. one. That's the way they were made back in those years. You looked up under prosthesis in your yellow pages. Pas Jean, actually, in Paris. Well. Yes. Well, up till now, it could be prostate trouble, but I think in a minute it's... Look at George. Wasn't he a good sport? Yeah. Uh, the problem was getting the water still. I know. And also that he had with to his... stay there. And, and, the, the, and the, the water didn't run up well, his shot nose. coming up, he stays there quite a while. Where you see him. He really, this there, one. this shot. He's and back bubbles. There, there was back bubbles there, a couple of times. He's back there. He's back there. He's under the water, and it's still... He's a, there, there, there. It's a, quite a deal for him. Because he wasn't really dead, you see. Oh, Actually, now that you mention, he's made more pictures. In some place. Actually, by today's standards, that's not gruesome. very bland. But it was then. But not. Look it at, really look at that wasn't look very at, gruesome even no. now. But then, yes, it was. They didn't do things like that. They were not. Look how beautiful. Look at that outfit. And hers is good too. No, I'm just kidding. It seems absolutely surreal to discuss the violence in this picture today in light of what we are now rather inured to. Today, the violence is unchecked. I think the beginning of it, it was two movies that unleashed this thing. On the one hand, you had Texas Chainsaw, uh, which, which was unspeakable at its time. Now it's considered tame, which is exactly... I think, what it caused. The other was The Exorcist. Uh, in horror movies, violence was, was not really shown. There was sort of an unspoken agreement between audience and filmmakers that we could scare you because we, the audience, knew you wouldn't go past the line. There wasn't one drop of blood shed in Frankenstein, the original Frankenstein. And in Dracula, which really involved the drinking of blood, you saw none. Who do you think did it? Gideon? Possibly. 
Here's the looping. Now, what, what happens here? The, this, the, the, what looping. happened was that this movie was about to open at the Radio City Music Hall. Uh, it was just about two weeks or three weeks away from it, which was opening in, in November of 63. It was Thanksgiving time. It was a Christmas show. Just after, it was going to open just after Thanksgiving. Well, as you remember, in November of 63, the president was killed. Kennedy and, was assassinated. And suddenly I woke up in bed. Stanley was back in London. I woke up. I was in Hollywood making another movie. And... Suddenly, said him, Ben, I said, my God, the word assassinated is in the script. Twice, in fact, in this scene. And you have no idea what that word was like. It was In those days, you thought you'd never be able to use that word again, ever. Uh, it's funny how soon everybody heals. But the fact is, it was in this scene. And I, it was about to open at the Radio City Music Hall, and it would, it would be just awful. It would have been just awful. So I called the studio, and I said, you got to do something about this. Uh, and I had lay awake all night figuring out a word that could dub it because it's not wasn't easy. And the only word I could find was eliminated. He says, it had to have a, the same number. The of same syllables. number of syllables and end with eight. And it was cut into the movie. And it was like that for the first many many years. I mean, any minute now we could be assassinated. Would you do anything like that? What assassinate someone? No, I recently saw it on television. I'm to my not sure which word is in now. To, now it's assassinated again. I don't to know my who did that. I don't know who did either. It's, I'm astonished by it. It's back in. And I don't know who did that. I'm not sure it's in this it is. version. It is. I'll bet you it's in this version. Well, I don't know how you can do that. I, mean, I don't either. We make a soundtrack. That's the soundtrack. I realize that. But we did add... They had the original soundtrack. Yeah, the original. but why, why would anyone change it? Back again? Yeah. Because it was real. And it didn't. it did not look... To a very trained eye, you could see it wasn't exactly right. I'll be surprised if it doesn't say eliminate. All right. I'll put money on assassinate. You may be right. I, just I don't know. I, how would I know? They don't have the right to do it. To put it back the way you made it? I made it with eliminate. No, you didn't. Yeah, of course I did. That's the way the picture was released. It was released, but you made it. But That's the way I made it. The I way understand. the picture's released is the way I made it. Right, but they put it back. They're only next door. If anything happens, holler. Carrie was uh, an original and uh, a unique entertainer and actor and presence. He was, first of all, absolutely gorgeous. And yet, he didn't threaten men. There were some men who were so attractive that men felt threatened by them. Women swooned at them. And somehow, Carrie, there was enough charm in him and, a much, and enough self-amusement that men liked him, too. And there haven't been a lot of heroes like that. I think Sean Connery is such a person. What are you doing? I'm taking off my shoes. What do you think I'm doing? Did you ever hear of anyone taking a shower with their shoes on? Well, this is the scene where he didn't want to do this. And frankly, I don't blame him. I, it really doesn't make a lot of sense, except I thought it was for him to do this would be funny. And I, it is. But he argued for two and a half days that he didn't want to do this. Why would I do this? It's stupid. I don't want to do it. It's silly. This argument went on, and finally I couldn't stand it anymore. I said, okay, let's forget it. It's not worth all this. Cut it out. Well, wait a minute, he said. Maybe there's some way we can do it. Well, he took to it and uh, had the best time of his life doing this. He loved it. Added things to it. The whole idea was slightly foolish. There's no question of it. It got even worse. He wanted to wear sh her shower cap. He kept saying, where's the shower cap? We, I want the shower cap. I want to take the shower cap. We said, no. He said, no, I really want it. So I said to Stanley when he wasn't around, I'm going to hide it, and torture will not get me to tell where it is. And he forgets, or he doesn't forget, but you did it, he didn't. And therefore, he, he wanted you to, we wanted us to talk him out of that shower cap. <laughs> I introduced them. They didn't know each other the first time they met. Audrey said, I've never met Cary Grant. You've got to bring us together. So uh, I invited them to have dinner in a, an Italian restaurant in Paris. And uh, Cary had on a light tan suit. And uh, they, he, I took Audrey and Cary arrived separately. And when he came in, she stood up. And I said, well, I don't have to tell each other your names, but Cary, Audrey. And she said, I'm so nervous. And he said, what are you nervous about? And she said, well, meeting you, I don't know how to behave. And he said, it's very simple. Turn your palms upward, sit down in your seat, and put your head down on the table and breathe. 
and now do that. And he sat across from her, and she put her palms up and put her head down on the table and turned over a bottle of red wine all over his light tan suit. So he had dinner in a restaurant covered in red wine and a light tan suit. He was a good sport about it. Well, but that was caused, their meeting. Because he caused it. He caused it. That was their meeting. But they, they liked each other and wanted to work again. And What's almost not did. to like? From hunger, you've only eaten five times today. I'll get someone to fix up my suit quickly and take you out to dinner. Let's go somewhere crowded. I feel like a lot of people. That's the real bateau mouche. One of them. That's one of them. That's the big one. That is not the real bateau no. mouche there. That's a little thing. And behind there is what's called a plate, which is a little movie going behind them. What I love is in the sound, when they go under these bridges, the sound goes all echoey, echoey and it's funny. Me? I don't suppose you know who the murderer is, do you? No, not yet. Whoever's left alive at the end will pretty much have sewn up the nomination, don't you think? Isn't that Bridge. amazing how that happened? Amazing. It's just the kind of good luck, I guess. Become the next victim? It's a start, anyway. Both Stanley and I were around when the first generation of talking screen actors arrived. And somehow they were all prototyped. But there were categories were filled. There was the Spencer Tracy category, and there was the Robert Taylor category, and there was the, you know, and as soon as someone came along to replace them, they could gracefully retire. Because they were categories. They were the firsts. Carey was such a person. He did play a romantic part in the next movie that I wrote, uh, which was his next to last movie. But he was a, played a grizzled beachcomber, but he got the girl. It was based on an original script by another writer who had written it as a melodrama, and I turned it into a comedy, and Carey and Leslie Caron did it. We were nominated for the Academy Award, and actually, we won the Academy Award, that other writer and myself, and we had never met, and we wouldn't have known who the other one was, except we met on the stage getting our Oscars. What do you mean? It was a romantic story, and so he got Leslie Then he Carroll, made one after that, too. Where he was really a, a, the good angel for somebody else's romance. One day as a game, when it was raining and we were supposed to be shooting outside, we had nothing to do. We sat down, Carrie included, we all sat down to see if we could count the number of leading ladies he had. And when we got to about... 65 or 70, we stopped. Because it was, on the young side, Shirley Temple, and on the old side, Ethel Barrymore. I mean, you know, and then everybody in between. But I mean everybody. If you look at this uh, sequence, you'll see that they're going down the river, the same buildings on both sides of the river. Yes, that's because, a funny thing about Paris. Because I only wanted to light up one side of Paris to make these plates. So behind him, behind her, if you check it close enough, is the same thing. But if you're looking at that, we're in a lot of trouble. Well, there's the Beaux Arts. There's the Beaux Arts back there, the the art school. And that was done separately by a unit going out just to make the plates. They lit it up as that a piece of done a night. Yes, but, but we're, we're divorced. divorced. Mm. That's right. Now go and eat your dinner. Oh, I could eat a horse. I think that's what you ordered. Don't you dare. This is the line I used to put in every movie. I could eat a horse. And then a different response to it. What was it here? It looks like you ordered. It looks like that's what you ordered. Yeah. Yeah. Now it turns out all you're interested in is the money. That's right. Oh. Well, what would you like me to say? That a pretty girl with an outrageous manner means more to an old pro like me than a quarter of a million dollars? A song isn't eligible for an Oscar unless it's not the melody isn't alone isn't eligible. You have to have words with it. There's a famous story of Dmitri Tiomkin. I was told this by Julie Stein and Sammy Khan. He had written the whistling theme from The High and the Mighty. La, da, 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 da. He wrote that, and it's whistled, and it's all throughout the movie, and it's wonderful. And then Dimitri Jomkin found out that it couldn't be nominated. It didn't have a lyric. So he had Ned Washington write a lyric, and they, he actually paid to have a theater, because the rules say it has to play at least a week in a theater in Los Angeles. And he went out and he hired a theater. He dubbed the song lyric in. He played the film with the lyric. And it was nominated. So I said to Julie, or Tammy, I don't remember which, did it win? He said, of course not. Our song, Three Coins of the Fountain, won. So, <laughs> which is why they told the story, I guess. But the lengths they went to to get the song nominated. It's so, not a song if it doesn't have That's right. And so it had to be played, and this was the place to do it. Oh, did they do that kind of thing way back in your day? Sure. How do you think I got here? 
Carrie insisted on, there's a couple of phrases here that Carrie wrote himself. His back, huh? Oh, no. Doctor said it was bad for my thermostat. I right. like to remind people you did this. And I know. To take we, blame. Except Stanley's being mean, but, but, but the fact is he cringes when he hears them too, and so do I. And yet they're in his style, and you don't seem to mind. You but don't mind. I, don't, I don't really mind, except that it's... No, I mean, one doesn't mind. No. No. Although I didn't like them. I don't like them either. I'd rather have Cary Grant in the line. That's right. And another thing about Cary, of course, Stanley directed him expertly, and other people too, but there are pictures, there are people who outlive their style, who, who suddenly look old-fashioned today. Carrie's pictures, with very few exceptions, are very much of today. They don't date. His pictures hold up. Are you out of your mind or something? It's 3.30 in the morning. You mean it? <laughs> I gave everybody a quirk. I did it again in Pelham 123. I gave the same sneezing quirk to Walter Matthau. Well, actually, to Marty Balsam. And it's Walter Matthau with his Gesundheit that, that uh, was the end of the picture. Marty Balsam had it in uh, the taking of Pelham 123. Now, we're going to tell the story in a minute. Here comes a shot. Yeah, this is what... And coming then, up. Then now, this shot story. coming up. Caused what the British call a controversy. The studio didn't like the idea that you saw three dead bodies in the film. Yes, that you see actually you four. See, counting the opening shot of the picture. Yeah. And they, they, well, the, that one they couldn't take out, but they wanted to take out the shot of the three bodies, and, and I was beside myself. I said, the picture won't have any sting to it. it it'll all to be too bland. So they said, well, would you do us the favor of previewing it twice? Once, cut them out for one screening and see if there's any difference it's, in the cards. It's too violent. Peter and I had seen the picture by then 8,000 times, and... We wandered out into the lobby but while the picture was still on, and we noticed the preview cards were lying on the table with a lot of pencils. So we just looked at each other without even discussing it, and each picked up a few cards. Just and, a few, just like five apiece. And filled out. It said, which scenes do you like best? And we wrote on the cards more or less the same thing. Where the do you see bodies. the dead bodies? The violence, the dead bodies. That's maybe, the best part. Maybe 10 movie. or 15 cards we wrote that said that. 10 maximum, I'm sure. And then the next night, they previewed the picture without the bodies. So we w again wandered out and said, which scenes... Did, did you not like? He said, the scenes where you don't see the dead bodies. There's not enough violence not enough, in this picture. Yeah. It's so bland, so, we said. It's so bland. So that's how they stayed. And we came in Monday morning. We said, well, you guys were right. These yeah, cards are definitely... They tell the story. <laughs> <laughs> they had no say in it, but that's they, they would have put some pressure on it. Yeah? Now, you listen to me, Dial. Look, I know who's got that money, man, and I want my share. Seems to be growing and growing every day. Well, I... I grew up in Hollywood. My father had been a school teacher in New York, went out to Hollywood very early in silent days and became a kind of a writer of silent film for Tom Mix, the cowboy star. And after that, he became a sort of a producer, and at Fargo, he was a very... He produced the old Shirley Temple movies and a lot of others. And I grew up out there, and for some reason... Film, while I loved going to film and loved seeing film, my interest was somehow more in the stage. And as soon as uh, I was out of high school, I went back east and got involved in uh, in theatrical uh, production. Is this a, is this this a peppermint flavor? Peppermint flavored tooth powder, see, we refer to it. This is the tooth third powder. place yeah. where we're not allowed to talk about it. No, you, you, you don't want to talk about it. Here. No. 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 Look, she just woke up looking like that. I wish I knew whether she looked like that in real life when yeah, she just woke clothes. up. Okay. Now, of course, what they're doing is looking for the $250,000 that disappeared. 
Uh, maybe it's diamonds. Maybe maybe it's they don't know what the emeralds. heck it is. They, they still can't find it, it, but this is all he had with him. Maybe it's a key to a and safety they, deposit they know box. He, they know he still had they, it. Because $250,000 there on there's the shot. It's there right. on that, in that shot. Right. Where's the money? And you just saw it. Right. And I said to Stanley, you've got to be honest. you got to well, show it. Well, it was. It was I in know, that shot. It was. After college, actually before I was out of college, I started going to Europe. My mother had relocated, remarried and relocated there, and I went to visit, and I was no sooner in Paris, I must have been about 19, when I realized that's what I wanted. to. That's where I wanted to be, that's what I wanted to do, and was be there. And so the, I spent all of my time there until I graduated, and then full-time. I lived there for almost 13 years. And it was there that I got the idea for Charade. While I was there, I'd worked for CBS uh, radio for a while, the news department, and um, I was trying to write a screenplay, and um, that was when I got the idea to do charade. It didn't come easily. I had never had any experience with mysteries, but because my father had made so many, I learned to read on Charlie Chan scripts, which he produced at Fox. He produced dozens, and I, I sort of learned to read on them. And there is a formula to, to, to mysteries, and um, it's still used because it's uh, the way they're done. It's the way melodramas are done. Uh, it's the way Agatha Christie's are all done. And so it was that that I wanted to do. But because I was also a, a comedy writer, I, I put the two, I, the two concepts together. Last time I said, I love you, Alex. Oh. Oh. Here they are at UNESCO. UNESCO didn't give us permission. Legal doesn't let you do certain things. For instance, her name in the original script was, was Lambert. But there, was a, there were three Regina Lamberts in America, so we had to change her name to Lampert. They had all had their husbands killed. All, every one of the Regina Lamberts had, had, was a simultaneous translator in Paris <laughs> and had husband husband been had been killed, died, killed yeah. right, <laughs> and who dressed in Givenchy clothes, all three. All and they three all lived in Paris. That's right. Talk about a small world. His names are my well, son's names. Uh, the main different one is that when he's Peter Joshua, those are the names of Stanley's two sons. Peter and Joshua. Yeah. I, I, so being a hooker by, by in nature that I am, I allowed those names to be changed. Nothing the police thought was very important. Can you remember anything in it at all? We well, did say something about Charles' last appointment. With whom? Where? I think it only said where. No, no, come on. I never saw the original script. I, 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 it went back to the script pretty much. I mean, there were some, we, we talked changes. There were changes, no I question. Don't, I don't know. I can't answer you since I never saw the other Yeah. Script. It was called Charade, the script. And when it was submitted as a novel, it was, the novel's called Charade. Red Books didn't allow certain things to be in. First of all, they changed the title. The Unsuspecting Wife. Isn't that awful? But when you work in... Red Book, you have to have one of four words present in every title. Wife, God, dog, or Lincoln. Has to be, one of those four words has to be, had to be in every title that they published. Of the Western Hemisphere conference held on March 22nd. No, wait. It was last Thursday, 5 o'clock, Jardin des, des Champs-Élysées. That's it. That's it. They're all hearing it. See, they out in the, in the oh, room. Oh, is that what it is? I wondered why they turned. That's the reason. Oh. Do you realize how many outfits she had in that? See the vrai guignolet? Yeah, the little theater. Uh, the real guignolet. The real guignolet. How many outfits she had in that? those two little Louis Vuitton bags that she came back from? Look at that coat. Ten minutes ago, I had a job. She was playing a, a, a someone who had no. I mean, she she had money a little money once, but she's a simultaneous translator at at what is the equivalent of UNESCO, and um, she all her clothes were gone. They were sold. All she had, what was left, was in the baggage she came back from uh, Majev with. She's the baggage. Good looking baggage. Look at Le Rond Point, it's so beautiful. 1962. Now. Now you see Coburn. It's hopeless, I don't even know what we're looking for. I don't think Tex does either. Tex, is he here? Look. Lucky you standing there where the little 
merry-go-round. Because it made a more interesting made shot. Made a more interesting Yeah, he could have just been standing in the middle of all that middle gravel. Of all that stuff. Yes, it wouldn't have been as good. Look at that's more so interesting. He, they, he went there, too. Now. And here comes the plot unfolding. Now, this is where the whole this thing starts. This is where the start, plot where The whole idea came to me for the, for the story in the first place. Well, not exactly here, but a similar one. No, well, this one. This is a fake. It's in the. This is indoors. This is a no. It's outdoors. No, but, but it's, it's where. But it's where the original is. Yeah, that's what I say. Yeah, and um, every Wednesday and Saturday afternoon, or Tuesday and Saturday. I don't remember. See, now. there it is. Now you get it. Every Tuesday or Wednesday, or Saturday afternoon, this thing is set up, the Marche au Tambre, the the stamp market. And then it's taken down again. All these stalls are put up and taken down again every twice a week. And I was writing another story, and I got stuck. And I t it was Saturday afternoon, and I was I was on the shows these and I, I I took a walk to clear my head because I, I didn't know what. And I saw this thing. Now I had been living there for 12 years in Paris, and I had never seen it. I just I just never saw it. And I said, Oh my! Because what I'd been looking for was a place to hide the money. Because I, I love the idea of hiding the money in plain sight. It's a Sherlock Holmes thing. The best place to hide anything is out where nobody looks at it in plain sight. And that's how, that's where the that's, that's what where they the were idea. looking at. That's what we weren't talking about. And earlier. so the stamps the, are on the, the envelope, stamps and nobody on the envelope were worth two hundred fifty thousand dollars. And nobody looks at the envelope. You look at the letter inside, which is what the the notion was. You write mysteries to be seen a second time, not that actually people will go a second time, but if they were to go a second time, they wouldn't say, oh, you didn't tell me that, or you didn't give me a chance to figure it out. Oh, you hid that part, that's cheating. So you write it as though you're showing it to people for the second time and being scrupulously fair with parceling out the information and the clue. There, you take it, it's all yours. <laughs> the character of Tex, Stanley had seen Jimmy Coburn, I guess, in The Magnificent Seven. Uh, this was still early in his... Uh, dialogue had not been his thing, and frankly, toward the end, where he had a lot of dialogue, he, he wasn't yet in his... Although later, he more than made up for it, but at that point in his career, it was difficult for him to learn dialogue. It's not that he didn't learn... It was difficult for it to be in his mind when he was acting. Uh, he could act or he could remember, one or the other at that time, and he didn't do both the way he very shortly thereafter came to do. But he had such a presence, and presence is so important in film. Good Lord, where is he? What's the matter, Chérie? The stamps. There was a fortune. What? When I couldn't sell the original screenplay, I was advised by my wife and my agent concurred to turn it into a novel. It was so long anyway that it turned into a novel. I had never written a novel, and it was in the course of writing this novel that I came to realize that I had no ability for writing novels at all. It's a different set of muscles. There are very, very few people who write dramatic material and narrative prose. Uh, very few. Chekhov could do it. I mean, there are, there are just, there are some. Uh, there are some today who can do it. Um, uh, Richard Price can do it. I mean, there, there are people who know how to do that, I guess, Crichton. They just call on a different set of muscles. It, one is descriptive and uses language in a way that dramatic material does not. Dramatic material, everything has to be revealed through behavior. That's all you have to reveal it with. And description plays such a small part in it. It's just a different set of muscles at work, and I don't have them, or I never developed them, and, or I, I wasn't interested in them, or something. But I sure discovered it immediately. So it was a rotten novel. Come on. Oh, but he's gone. I don't blame him. Now, this actor, is a, I, I worked with him, too, in the same television series as Marat. Wonderful actor who was in Le Diabolique and several other good movies. Oh, he was the inspector, in fact, not the inspector, but one of the inspectors in um, with Carrie and Grace Kelly in, I think, in To Catch a Thief. Anyway, he's a wonderful actor. That's the actor. picture we ran. Yeah. I know them as one knows his own face, though I had never seen them. This one. That's there they are, the, the three, three stamps. stamps. The Swedish for Skillinger. What's it worth? Money doesn't. It's still not, oh, they can hear all that. Oh, sorry. The they're, stamps they're, are they're, real. they're slightly altered, but not really. I mean, they are the real stamps. 
I, I found the stamps in a stamp book, the three most valuable stamps in the world. And um, well, together. Well, description of them. In a well, no, their book. pictures were actually yeah, there. Yeah, pictures of them. Yeah. Value today. 65,000. And the last one? They're privately owned stamps by stamp yeah. collectors. One of the, I mean, there's more than one of most, uh, there, there's one or two or three of each. The one cent one is hand drawn, there's only yeah. one of those. Yeah. The terrible part is we had to inflate their value. They were not quite worth a quarter of a million dollars. They're probably worth 10 million. Today they're worth 10 million dollars. But in those days, a quarter of a million dollars was a great deal of money. Today, it's pocket change for a movie. As a matter of fact, her next movie was How to Steal a Million. It's a lovely coat. There's a little hat that went with it. Audrey had people she felt comfortable and secure working with. Clearly, Givenchy and she had a great affinity, a great symbiotic relationship. She was the perfect model for his clothes, and he designed for her. And frankly, I think his designs for her were the model that went out to the rest of the world. And most movie stars have their people, and uh, people who they whose loyalty is not questioned and whose affinity for them and vice versa was, they, they were comfortable. Now, this was the other piece of violence which they wanted us to take out. But look, he's, he looks good, even dead, because he's wearing that shirt. Look, his forehead is even all crinkled up. He's you know, actually sure. not dead. He's, he's not? Pretending. There was the clue, dial. That's what it said, on the nap of the carpet. Now, I used to, as a kid, I could found I could draw things on the carpet on the nap if you drew a certain way, and you and you could erase it by going back the other way. But poor Stanley couldn't find any way to, that it would register for the camera. Well enough, but we, it's close. We managed, yeah. It's close. I actually painted it a little bit, or water, something, I don't remember. Tex is dead, smothered. It was important to have somebody of enormous basic quality. Uh, that is to say, someone who was had charm and intellect. She had quality written all over her. She, she, she could not have played um, uh, someone from the other side of the tracks, as we like to call it. Mrs. Lampert, uh, you better give that to me again. The reason Walter worked so well, and that was the idea. It wasn't that we got Walter and said, oh, I know, we'll make it funny. The real way to hide the villain was to make him amusing. Let's see. Um, do you know the Senate Garden at the Palais Royale? The fact that he's sort of a fool, he couldn't be the villain. I mean, you know? Uh, so therefore, that was terribly useful. And so every time, and this was Stanley, when every time she cut to him, he was doing something. He was doing his exercises, doing knee bends. So as long as he remained a kind of comic foil for her, he was beyond suspicion. Reggie, wait! You fight so you can kill me too. Tex is dead. He will die on the carpet. I'm not dying. You know that. Tex doesn't know it. You're a murderer. Reggie, I want no stamps. This was a great joke. The cab drivers only want to go one place. They always have a sign in the window. They only want to go there when they want to go home. Yeah, because their garage is there. So, they're they're never, the so it's like an off-duty sign. The subway chase was, uh, there were, the background of it, the underpinning of it was quite subtle because it involved a number of things that were very, very French. And yet people who knew Paris well enough would have known about it, but the general audience wouldn't, it wouldn't have changed their perception. This is a real subway. This is a real station. subway. This it is was real... actually not in use. She ducked into the subway. First of all, she'd been in the subway, he hadn't. So she knew that she had to buy a ticket, he didn't. She ran down, and she also got a first-class ticket. That She knew there was first class on every subway train. Things were added, things that are visual, which the chase is, is not what you put in a book, you know. I guess that we God did. Knows. I, don't I don't know. remember whether it was in the original screen, but I don't think I think, think anything was. that wasn't in the book is my idea, yes, clearly. Yes, that's probably true. I have no idea who I thought of what. I never can remember what. that. I don't even remember whether the subway wasn't in the script and taken off of the book. I doubt it. I think we discussed the subway was a good... I have no idea. Oh, the thing that I liked about was it... Was it my name Stanley when we did the movie? Yeah, it was. Mm. I tried to rewrite it, but I couldn't. The thing I liked about this sequence were two things. I liked the pneumatic doors that you just saw closing. And the whole concept... The red car is first class. The subway at that time, for all I know, it's still true has two classes, and for a little more money, you can get in the red car, and the red car, being first class, 
you, there are seats available. And so people pay a little more. It's not about rubbing elbows with the hoi polloi. It's about, it's about getting a seat. It was a chase, and a chase is quite different than a confrontation. It's, it's, it's just leading. There's certain rules that used to be in cinema. I don't think they are anymore. You can't enter in a chase from the same side you left. You, I think now it doesn't matter anymore, but, but it used to matter. And so a chase was mapped out fairly routinely. It was the tension in that. It was them both being on the same car and looking through the window. He was in the second class car, couldn't enter the first class car, and so he merely was there close to her, but yet couldn't touch her. It was all of that stuff, which is mostly suspense rather than action. That's a real subway car. Uh, sure. See the red first class? See, there's a one on it. But that's not a real staircase. It went yes, up, it is. It went up to nothing. No, you that's the real subway station. I know you couldn't it was. Get out but you put, I know, but you put a fake staircase in the middle of the of the station. Uh, for that shot, and it, it was a ceiling, and you could only shoot him going up so far, and they couldn't shoot him any farther. I remember that. Those are real boots. We put them where we wanted them. Audrey, in the publicity, was looked upon as just this beauty, uh, this glamorous thing, or this whatever, and didn't really focus on her as a human being. But human beings were not what publicity was involved with then. There was one good thing about that, and that is there remained a kind of distance with stars. They remained glamorous, and you can't remain glamorous if you're going to know whether they bathe or not regularly. And these great stars of the cinema remained glamorous because there was a distance between us and them, and that distance is what created the glamour and the excitement and the mystery, and we don't have that today. Charlie had an ability to make the actors look good without sacrificing dramatic lighting. I mean, it was very easy with dramatic lighting to make the stars look menacing, or, but he could make them look wonderful at the same time. He really was a master lighter, which is all a cameraman is. He's called a lighting cameraman. Uh, everything else, I mean, the framing of it, most of that comes from the director. What the cameraman does is light, and that's the most important thing. And Charlie was, was, a, was just a master of it, plus the fact that he was fast. And in Hollywood terms, in, in movies, time, nothing costs as much as time. Here's where the, um, the plot unfolds. Here's the real Bartholomew. And at this moment, we discover that Walter Matthau was not Mr. Bartholomew. He was, he's, he's the bad guy. And this is where you discover it. Now... When you write a mystery, there's two things you got to figure out. One is where to hide the money, and the second is how to hide the killer. And there he is, revealed for the first time he's the bad guy. He's been a clown up till now, and he's no longer clownish in any fashion or form. Anyway, so what, you write a mystery from the end. You, get, you figure out the solution, and then you can go back and write the movie. But, but you can't do it hoping to end it, hoping to get lucky and find an ending by accident or... And so um, it started with the stamps and the embassy. The embassy is a perfect place to hide the killer because you don't, he's got you in an office. He's a, he's a CIA man at the embassy. And the other is the money and putting it on the stamps. And once you had those two things, the whole story unfolds toward that, toward those two things. Carrie runs nice. She runs nice. This, this, is, yeah, this sequence was one of the coldest nights on earth. And we were all in d double anoraks and silk-lined underwear and God knows what all. Even Walter Matthau and Carey were in silk underwear and all of that because it was so cold. We had little fires going in, in the tin rubbish bins. And, and Audrey, I thought she was going to die. You can see her, how cold she is yeah. there. This she couldn't a, have any of those clothing. It's the Palais clothing. Royale, which is a section just off the Avenue de l'Opera. There's a theater there, a real theater there. Um, Who was the Minister of Culture when we did this? Well, Man's was it Ma Fate? Malraux. Malraux yeah. was the Minister of Culture, and I wanted to shoot this sequence in, in the Palais Royale. And they said, you can't do that because Monsieur Malraux's office 
is just above where you're shooting, and you can't shoot it there. I said, but the whole climax of the movie is based on being in there with all of these columns in this place. And, and next to the theater. And it's also next to the theater, and it's extremely colorful, and everything works. We've got to be there. I said, he won't, you can't. We cannot do that to the, Mr. Malro. And uh, so I wrote him a letter and said, dear Monsieur Malro, we want to make this movie, and uh, they won't allow us because your office... And he said, oh, of course use it. And that's how we got there. And he was, he was uh, very friendly to movies. After all, he had married Gene Seberg. And um, not yet. Not yet, but he liked movies. Mrs. Lambert, they knew I was still alive, but they left me there. That's why are we I... sure they weren't married yet? No, they weren't married. Some of those columns are added. Yeah, I had two extra columns that I moved around. Right. You're running out of time. I've come too far to turn back. I swear I'll kill you. Make up your mind, Mrs. Lambert, now. Adam! He missed. Oh. No. If he hit him, it was over then. The movie would have been over. It would have been over. Now watch Walter when he runs. Even then, look, he is silly when he runs. There's not much you of him. You don't see it there. You do see it Here's a little. Here's the shot coming up, but yeah. you only see him from the waist up. There he, he goes. was funny. Yeah. He was a funny runner. There he goes. Well, now he's stopping. See, now she runs into the real theater, Palais Royale, the, the actual the theater. door into the Palais into Royale. the real There's stage the door. shot where you see yeah. him running, but you don't see his feet. Every movie, the camera work is done to suit the scene and the action and the people and the mood, and so every movie it's different. What interior was this? This is a real theater, but yeah, not but it wasn't the real the theater. Royale, no, no, not the real theater. I, I know don't it's remember. A real theater. I don't remember, I don't remember which theater we used. But uh, all right now, this was the final idea. Was this in the Red Book? Was this in the book? Yeah, in the, I didn't have Cary Grant in the book. Oh, what a shame! Yeah. Oh, she's in the prompter's she's box. She's locked in the prompter's box. And he's gone, what every theater has, it doesn't quite look like this, but what every theater has really is the trap room. Yeah, but nothing like this. Nothing like this. This is a total fake. Total fake, but wonderfully photogenic. But you couldn't, you can't make a floor where every no, square has no. got a trap in it. No, but that you see. But that's the fun of this. That's the fun of what happened. There they are. It's a great idea, fake or no. The entire picture cost what Walter Matthau gets today for a picture. Yeah, or even less. Well, it was big for those days. Yeah. Everything is comparative. Oh, that's what gets him. Oh, oh my. I don't know what theater that is. I don't either. This, of course, is the studio. That's the theater. The footsteps. You have to identify where he's standing. I know. I, pretty hard. Do you hear me? Come on out. Fortunately, he was able to do it. Otherwise, Audrey would be dead. I hate to think of what play they're doing there. I'd like to have a theater where every square is yeah. a trap door. And all you do is turn that knob. And you open it. Then you open it. Oh, no, I don't think it's that one. He's still moving. Nope, it's not that one either. He's still moving. You gotta wait till he stops. Oh, God, he's at, look, he's, even then he's showing the right side of his face. Even in that moment don't, of stress. Yeah. Now, the stopping is good and bad because you can't hear him anymore. So you've got 
but he stopped, and he's got a luger. Be good to have water come out of it. Yeah, the the, just picture. like the beginning. Yeah. Oh, oh, now this there was undercranked. Just that. Just Only that, that shot. Cut. I know that to make it look faster. And that wasn't Walter. No, and it wasn't Sol either. I don't no. think. That's Walter. That's Walter. He did the easy part, lying down. Now Here's this is the, the shot scene where he, he said Judy, Judy, Judy right. in here, but I don't have it. At the end of this scene, he stayed and said it. It was mine personally. You don't think there's a negative anywhere? No, I had it. You had I the had negative it too. Everything, yeah. They broke it off again. Yeah. Is that all the gratitude I get for saving your hide? Your yeah, rubber won't think you caught it. The truth now, was it my hide or those stamps? Well, what a terrible thing to say. How could you think that? Now, here you're about to hear, while I appeared in the movie earlier with Stanley's voice, you're about to see a Marine who has my voice. I did dub the Marine. So my voice and my person are in the movie. They're just not in the same place. That's coming up in one second. Oh, I, I can remember my line still. Marine, ma'am. As a taxpayer. Who's a taxpayer. There I am. There was somebody. Excuse, Excuse me, sir. Sir. Marine, ma'am. Oh. I remember saying that. Who would I see regarding the return of stolen government money? Crookshank. Mr. Crookshank. The Treasury Department, ma'am. Room 217, second floor, Mr. Crookshank. 217. Thank you, Marine. That's it. That's my whole part. Now, the secretary you're about to see was the, was the wardrobe lady. I had to stop shooting here because I had built the set incorrectly. She goes in there, and you have to see a door behind her with the office back there. Mm -hmm. And we came to shoot that scene, and I saw it, and I said, ah, oh, it's wrong. We have to go shoot something else and rebuild this set. She's the wardrobe woman. Right. Then there, and this is the reason. There he is, because he had to have a way to get in there. A little buggy. Yeah. Of all the mean, rough. She's furious. As angry as she could get at her. I to find out I'm not crooked. You can't even be honest about being dishonest. You can't even be honest about being dishonest, she said. I could tell that. Well, they're going to hear all that. Oh, are they? Yeah. I thought this is a hear us. I didn't know they had that. Look, at, look how she looks. She had her own outfit just for this. The lunch on. Probably worked it out in advance. He, of course, has the same suit. This was Mejev. This was in Michelle, right? This was done in the garage. This is Foster. Take a memo to Bartholomew in security, recommending Bartholomew. that Bartholomew. Recommending that embassy offices be kept locked during the lunch hour. Mm. Starting with his own. That's what Cary Grant looked like yeah. at sixty. It's That's not, not another that's sixty. What human beings look like. No. Serves me right if I get stuck with that one. Well, who asked you to get stuck with any of them? Come on. Now here's the only bone of contention I have with Stanley. I loved my last line in this movie, and you can't hear it because the music swells. Well, the reason was I hadn't thought of this until I was editing the picture. I know, but I can't hear it, and I loved it. Well, you can say it now and get your own back. It's the only way I can do it. As you know, he's had many, many identities and many names, and she always has to keep learning his new name. Marriage license. Marriage license. She's, did you say marriage license? Wait a See, minute. I had this idea. I had Here no ending. Now he says, "Oh, Peter." I had no ending oh, without Peter, those shots. Alex, Adam. I needed a visual ending, and if I put we have it boys, on with those names. She said, "If we have boys, we're going to name them all after you." Yeah. And that was the line I loved. We never could hear it. Well, now it's on this track. So well, go be crazy. It was my best closing line. <laughs> 